Hello everybody and uh, welcome to today's webinar. Uh, we're very pleased to welcome uh, Peter Lawson who is the Offshore Energy Liaison Officer for the HM Coast Guard. Uh, Peter is here today to deliver this session uh, for the IOSH Offshore Group and I'll shortly be handing you over to him. Uh, so whilst Peter just quickly prepares uh, to share his presentation with you all, I just want to run through a couple of things. Um, so first, uh, firstly, for those of you who haven't actually attended one of our IOSH webinars as of yet, I'm Ben Pollard and I take care of the technical aspects of these sessions. So any problems and I shall try to assist as best as I can. Uh, so um, located on your screen then, uh, at the top left hand side you should notice a small bar with some written options which are chat and Q&A. If you have any technical issues or audio problems and you need to message me at any point, please use the chat option. If you have any specific questions for Peter relating to the content of his session, please use the Q&A option and ask your questions here. Uh, I'll then run through all of the questions at the end of the presentation with Peter uh, and we'll aim to tackle as many of these as possible. If we do run out of time, uh, don't worry. What we will do is we'll look at your questions afterwards. We'll then put those in writing uh, following the session. Uh, so with all that said, uh, I'm gonna hand you over to Peter he'll be able to start start the session so peter over to you uh, thank you ben and uh, good afternoon everybody it's a pleasure to be able to present this uh, short webinar to you on offshore energy uh, emergency response i just want to spend just uh, a moment or two just introducing myself and give you a little bit of background on my uh, history in the coast guard and my current role and so as Ben says, uh, Pete Lawson, Offshore Energy Liaison Officer. And my background is really uh, coast guarding up in Aberdeen. I started as a, a watch assistant up in the operations room and worked my way through the various technical training uh, courses, uh, finishing up as a search and rescue mission coordinator who's responsible for any incidents that happened during my period of watch. Uh, I then left uh, for a couple of years and um, things like children and so on came along and uh, the shifts therefore didn't suit me quite so well. And um, so I worked for a couple of years as an emergency response training consultant um, at uh, one of the training providers doing some emergency response training for oil and gas and renewables. And then about four and a half years ago, I was able to come back into the Coast Guard in my, my current role. Uh, so just give you a bit of a flavor of, of some of the incidents that uh, I've been involved in in my time at the Coast Guard. Um, I just want to um, uh, show you some of, of them, uh, just bear, bear with me. Um, okay, uh, so the first one um, was, was one of, when I was really a junior um, Coast Guard, I'm not actually expecting to read all of that. Uh, this was a, a life, um, a, a fishing vessel who had put out a, a distress message on the radio. Um, and, uh, and we went out to, to support uh, that fishing vessel and the crew on board. Now, the reason I wanted to highlight this one is a, it was one of my first incidents I was involved in. Um, but also one of the messages that I'll, I'll speak about today is being prepared um, for emergencies. And, uh, and actually with this incident, um, the fishing boat, while it had a problem and while it uh, had to communicate with us, actually um, they were well prepared by having life jackets and life rafts on which enabled the helicopter to go and rescue them out of the left raft without any injuries, which was a positive uh, result, although the fishing vessel was lost. And the next one I want to mention was an interesting incident that I was a coordinator for. Uh, this was up in the north, north coast of Scotland, um, and it was uh, one of these thrill-seeking um, ribs that you can get on your holidays and go out for a bit of a blast around. And they went into a sea cave, you can see in the picture there, um, in, uh, in one of the islands and they broke down and actually while they did have their emergency suits on and so on they weren't particularly well prepared in terms of their plans and this resulted in quite a complex incident to us to respond to which included uh, lifeboats uh, helicopters and a passing yacht although to be fair i'm not sure what use uh, they would have been uh, next up um, was a, a quite a nasty incident uh, on the east coast of the country and the um, passenger vessel, you can see there, Scottish Lighting, um, and the homeland had a collision, and resulting in, in, a, in one fatality. Uh, the reason I highlight this incident is, again, it, it's stuck in my mind, but this had a really interesting focus on uh, media and media response. 
And while the incident was ongoing, I did an interview uh, live on the on the incident on on radio, and I gave my wee brief on the incident. And then, due to, well, the first question I had was, in this day and age, how can an incident such as this uh, have happened? Mm -hmm. And that was a very frustrating uh, question to get when we we're still looking for somebody who was missing at sea. Uh, but it does go to show some of the priorities that, that lie with the media. And next up, a slightly different incident again. Uh, this was the, the tragic collision between two tornado jets in the Murray Firth in Scotland. Uh, I came on to this incident as mission coordinator uh, just sort of halfway through the incident. Uh, and this was an interesting one in terms of our Coast Guard volunteers responding to search some of the shoreline. Uh, and some of the welfare issues that we had to consider um, and the complexities for, for looking for and searching for some of the, the wreckage and so on that may have come ashore. Uh, so we had to consider some of the welfare uh, issues for, for our own people as well as those involved in, in the incident itself. An actual industry incident next, and this is a picture um, of the evacuation of the Elgin uh, platform um, which had the Roman biking alongside it. Uh, this was when there was an uncontrolled gas release and we evacuated all personnel of those two installations. Now the reason I, I mentioned this one was really around the complexities of using a aircraft when there's gas in the area uh, but also multiple aircraft at any incident and the setup of restricted airspace which we can do uh, if needs be. And um, so this uh, this incident was, was an interesting one. It had a, a successful conclusion by the fact everyone was evacuated with uh, no injuries and um, but it was some issues for us around the management of aircraft and actually, when the incident was over, we could not remove the restricted airspace and because of, of the gas still there. So we did learn a fair bit of lessons following that incident. And next up was a, was a, a lucky chap, really, um, who was uh, on a, well, I call it a, a fishing vessel. It was more of a, a bit of a pleasure vessel. You can see it in the, in the picture there. And he went on a, a trip uh, up the East Coast and round into uh, the Murray Firth up north of Scotland. Uh, this went on for a long time, this incident. Uh, it was a night shift. Uh, and to cut a long story short, and um, effectively, we got a call um, from his girlfriend who said he was lost at night in the dark, um, thought he was coming in towards the Sutherland coast. Um, and we, you'll see there, we tasked a number of lifeboats, Coast Guard teams and a helicopter. And eventually, um, he was found about 70, 80 miles from where he thought he was about to hit um, one of the islands up in the Pentland Firth between Orkney and Scotland. So he was a lucky boy, again, um, not very well prepared. And again, it shows the importance of being prepared for for, um, for anything at sea. Uh, and lastly, the one I want to, want to finish on, on on this bit was the, the horrible incident uh, of the 1st of April in 2009, um, when that aircraft uh, had um, catastrophic failures and crashed into the sea just um, northeast or just east of Peterhead. And uh, this was um, one of my worst incidents I've been involved in, um, but really sort of defined, I guess, um, what can happen with industry and, and a lot of the things I now work with to try and um, protect against or to make sure we're, we're best prepared um, should an incident like that, that happen. So I've got a, a fair varied um, uh, history in terms of various incidents I've been involved in, uh, but now really my, my role does concentrate on oil and gas and on offshore renewables. And um, so anything related to those incidents, then it, it comes to, um, to my attention and I'll look after the search and rescue and emergency response elements uh, of, uh, of those industries. And ultimately trying to protect or trying to ensure that we're best prepared should a large uh, incident such as uh, Mumbai High in um, 2005, which I've got um, a picture of there. And I've got a little bit more to, to talk over that uh, a little bit later in my, my presentation. Uh, but for those of you who may not have heard me uh, speaking before or maybe not familiar with um, the, the Coast Guard and, and how we are set up to manage incidents, I just want to show a, a couple of slides uh, on, on how we respond to incidents and some of our requirements. Um, so this uh, slide is of the UK search and rescue region. Uh, this is a fairly large area for the size of Ireland that we are in the UK. Uh, and that covers our boundary between ourselves and the Canadians out to the west there. Uh, down between ourselves, sort of the Azores and the Spanish, uh, up through the Channel, and then between ourselves and, and the Norwegians and so on around the, the East Coast. So anything that happens within that area uh, comes to uh, the, the MCA and HM Coast Guard to coordinate any incidents within that area. 
Now, we have gone through a fairly large transition um, since 2015, or we started before uh, 2015, um, but effectively working on a national network uh, now that ensures that whatever incident occurs, you've got a station that will respond to that incident, and it's much more resilient, and there's much more in interoperability between the stations, uh, which, which is really very good. Um, inevitably, a couple of stations did close through that process, but we have left out with, with these um, stations that you can see on your screen um, there. We look after a number of different functions, search and rescue and pollution response would be um, the obvious ones. Uh, very quickly, vessel traffic management is about looking after various areas of the sea, such as the Dover Strait, and ensuring shipping is, is doing what it should do. And maritime safety information is about sharing information on incidents to our surveyors to make sure they can go and ensure vessels are safe to operate in the UK. It's about putting out weather broadcast, navigation broadcast to shipping. Accident disaster response is about our responsibilities under the Civil Contingencies Act. So for example, helping our partner emergency services with inland rescues, flooding, um, bad snow, or even down to uh, incidents such as Operation Stack down in Kent, uh, where the lorries back up on the motorway, and we have been out handing out bottles of water and so on there. Uh, and finally, maritime security is about sharing information with uh, colleagues and other organisations about shipping movements uh, around the coast, which may have some um, negative interest for, for the UK. Um, so just to show you how the national network work, works, um, we are one um, UK Coast Guard spread out across the UK, uh, and we are the only emergency service in the UK, which is UK wide, and we are, we're, we're proud of that. Uh, and effectively, what you're seeing here is all our stations uh, connected via uh, the cloud, uh, however that works, um, and all our zones around the country you see there, which are those lines around the coast, um, they are operational zones, and effectively what that means is from any station in the country, we can coordinate incidents anywhere else, which makes a very flexible um, system. And just an example for you, um, Aberdeen um, today, um, is doing a training day for all their staff, um, which means our National Maritime Operations Centre, uh, the red box down on the south coast there, is looking after the zones that Aberdeen would normally do. And we're all operating through the same um, system, same aerials, same incident management system, so very flexible. And that is a picture of said building down in Fairham, the National Maritime Operations Centre, or NMOC. A nice attractive building, as you can see. Uh, it was built initially for the fire brigade, uh, but never used, so we converted it into the um, operations room you see in the middle picture there. Uh, very quickly, um, down at the far side of the picture are our cells, which um, do most of the work. So they are taking the calls, taking 99 calls, speaking to the resources, doing the search planning, and so on. And each of those pods you'll get in each one of the stations around the country. You've then got three desks in the middle um, who are our duty controllers. Uh, they're looking after the tactical elements of incidents and overseeing the zones to make sure that nobody is overloaded uh, and providing additional assistance as required. And then nearest uh, to the bottom of the picture is the duty commander and he has got strategic overview uh, for the whole country and generally involved if there are and larger incidents involved, such as the one that's um, affecting um, Transocean and BP just now with, with Greenpeace. So that's the sort of thing we'd be keeping an eye on there. Um, okay, um, should there an incident occur um, for uh, anyone, but particularly for uh, offshore energy, um, we look to obviously get a contact um, very quickly um, from that incident. And normally speaking, that would be via telephone, um, or potentially a radio call if it was a marine asset that was that was involved. And so as you can see there, certainly for um, the oil and gas industry, uh, we have specific numbers uh, dedicated to the various zones. So what you're seeing there is oil Z3. That means it's an oil and gas call in zone three, and therefore the station and the operators that are dealing with that incident can take that call um, with the suitable priority associated with it. Um, we do ask for a fair amount of information when that call comes in. Uh, that's basically to ensure uh, that we have all the information to allow us uh, a suitable response to that incident. If contact with us fails, uh, you don't get through on the normal numbers, and uh, there's always 999 to be able to get in contact with the, with the Coast Guard. Okay, um, so that's give you a little bit of an overview, um, hopefully, of uh, what the Coast Guard has in its toolbox in terms of coordination centres. 
um, and how we can support a little bit in terms of industry. And what I want to do now is, um, is just highlight a couple of incidents and some learnings that have come from, from those. Um, so starting really with, um, with Piper Alpha, um, which uh, most people will probably have heard of uh, before, but um, the world's worst uh, offshore uh, disaster. And the reason I do um, highlight this incident, uh, apart from the fact that it, that it is the worst one that we've, uh, we've had, is there has been a lot of learning um, come from that incident. We've changed and, and moved on um, in the Coast Guard, which I've, I've highlighted some of that uh, already. But also following Lord Cullen's review into the incident, uh, which his report was published in, in 1990, uh, he had about 106 recommendations, all of which were accepted by industry, uh, which was a quite an interesting um, output from that report. Uh, and this really was a sort of the, the turning point for emergency response uh, and, and, and emergency response arrangements uh, that we know we know now. Uh, and some of these I've just picked out some of the, the, the bits and pieces that have come out following that that incident and the report from, from Lord Cullen. So EPOL, the Emergency Preparedness Officer Liaison Group. Uh, this is an industry group which is facilitated by now Police Scotland, um, which is um, uh, Coast Guard, HSE, uh, Oil and Gas UK, etc. Uh, sit on, and around 40 or so of the oil and gas companies. Uh, a really productive uh, group looking at emergency response issues, uh, addressing any learnings from incidents, and discussing in, in sort of chat and house rules any learnings that they've had from, from incidents and, and exercises. So it's, it's a positive group. Uh, it's a group that sometimes um, gets restricted uh, by uh, companies and I suppose lawyers' uh, willingness to share um, some experiences from incidents, but generally it's very, very useful. Uh, out of that also came a media protocol, uh, which ensured that any media response uh, was well coordinated between the police, the Coast Guard, and the, and the duty holder um, for the, 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 um, the company. Uh, which was um, a positive, again, step forward. PFIR came out in 1995, so that's the Prevention of Fire, Explosion and Emergency Response Regulations, ensuring that the safety standards offshore and the requirements in the duty holder are such, and, and, and HSE managed uh, those regulations very effectively. Major emergency management training and the equivalent um, are ensuring that OEMs, uh, offshore installation managers, and other members, key members offshore, are prepared and trained suitably, so that if an incident does happen, uh, they're best placed to respond to those incidents. And linked to that, um, we run in the Coast Guard an offshore search and rescue management course, uh, which more of that I'll discuss uh, later on. Um, and that is also supported um, by Police Scotland, uh, which offers a, a really um, useful insight uh, into emergency response and search and rescue um, for the oil and gas industry. Um, Interest and cooperation between emergency services, is much improved, we understand our roles and responsibilities. Um, however, there was not for a while a strategic, uh, excuse me, a strategic overview uh, for the at-sea emergency response. Um, so the integrated offshore emergency response document was created, uh, and this has gone through a number of uh, iterations and reviews uh, since it was first released. Um, and as I have just recently um, updated it again, and the, the most recent version, version three, you see in the picture there, Will be uploaded to the EPOL website in due course, so you can have a look at a look at that. So that's very much our focused on on oil and gas. Um, however, uh, back in 2003, now um, North Hoyle uh, was was built, um, which was the first the major offshore wind farm in the UK. Uh, and and while offshore renewables doesn't really have the hydrocarbon risk, or doesn't have the hydrocarbon risk that comes with oil and gas, it does bring its own challenges and its own risks of which we have to be prepared, prepared for. Now I do a lot of work with renewables now, which is, which is a really fascinating and an upcoming industry. And it's often looked upon as being the sort of new kid on the block, uh, if you like. Uh, but those who can do um, a certain bit of maths can work out that 2003 is 16 years, uh, 16 years ago. So that's 16 years of learning, 16 years of improvement. Um, and a lot of improvement has been made, particularly in, in recent years, although there is still a fair way to fair way to go with that, and I'll, I'll touch on some of that as, as we progress. And um, so, just a couple of incidents that have affected the, the renewables industry. And um, this incident that I'm going to talk about here did, wasn't actually uh, didn't result in, in any any danger. This was the Merch Nottingham, or just the Merch Nottingham, and as you can see, it's a large container vessel. And this was operating uh, off the Thanet uh, wind farm which was under construction at the time down off the um, sort of southeast uh, coast. 
Uh, and it's um, had some power failures and started to drift. And now, thankfully, and because of the fact that it was under construction, there were a couple of tugs in the area. And within about, uh, well, th within 20 minutes anyway, 15, 20 minutes, uh, those tugs were able to put a, a line onto the vessel and tow it away from danger. However, we looked at the, the drift of that vessel and using our search planning software, we're able to predict where we feel that the, the vessel would have drifted. And as you can see from this slide here, the course of the vessel would have drifted through, um, through that wind farm. Unsure exactly what damage that would have caused to either the, the, the structures of the wind farm or to the vessel, uh, but that was, a, that was a potential close call. There have been a number of, of these incidents um, over the past. There's, there's two or three uh, high profile ones, which I've, uh, I talk about a number of other smaller ones. Um, but the, the potential always uh, is there, and I'll talk more about that uh, later on. Uh, this incident um, happened back in 2012. Uh, it was actually one of two incidents on the same day. Uh, but this was um, on the East Coast, uh, and this CTV crew transfer vessel was coming back into shore uh, off course and hit the Donanook air weapons uh, marker, which you can see in the bottom picture, at uh, about 23 knots or so at uh, high speed. Uh, I, did, uh, I did a fair bit of damage, caused some injuries, thankfully uh, nothing too serious, uh, although it could have been uh, much worse. Equally, uh, this CTV crew transfer vessel on, the, uh, on a different wind farm, Shedding Shoal Wind Farm, just off the Norfolk coast, um, it struck one of the um, turbines in its own wind farm, slightly slower speed, uh, but again, there was a, a risk there of, of much more injury than, than was happened. Uh, and then this incident, this was actually a larger vessel which was in a collision with a, a CTV in, in foreign uh, waters. Uh, again, some maritime incident, uh, but these risks are there, do happen. Um, there was a, a, another collision um, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so they are out there, so we have to make sure we're best prepared. Um, so the next, um, the next little bit I want to show, I just want to show how we, we deal with incidents. And then what I'm going to do is uh, uh, channel my um, influence, my son, my, my five-year-old son, really, uh, with a bit of um, with, a, with a good old Batman uh, in, inside me. So um, really, really a bit of a, a, an incident occurs. So this is a, an oil and gas example, uh, but clearly the, the principles still remain um, from renewables as, as well. Uh, so what we'd expect is uh, the offshore installation manager uh, to be notified of some kind of incident uh, by means of uh, alarms, uh, by, by, by third party reports, uh, and then we'd expect them to go to muster stations. And potentially there might be um, some deluge and uh, sprinkler systems and so on may go off uh, and he'd be looking potentially, he or she may be looking potentially for, for some shutdown or some blowdown activities uh, or other, other elements off, offshore. Uh, after that, um, they'll be looking to mobilise uh, the emergency response team offshore and um, work out what their intentions are, work out what the risks are, and then have their um, time out uh, to, um, to to brief the, the, the team, uh, have a tannoy uh, to the rest of the troops uh, offshore, uh, and then call back into town, TTT there, time out, tannoy town. And one of the, the first calls we'd expect offshore to make, and again, I, I apologise, an oil and gas example, but the same would apply for renewables, is to call into the Coast Guard. Uh, so get a nice early call in to us. It doesn't mean to say that assistance is required, um, but an earlier call allows us to put some plans in place, notwithstanding the fact that both industries require um, their own arrangements to respond to emergencies. We, of course, are there to, to support that uh, if needs be. Uh, so call in to us. We will start information gathering, establish the correct emergency phase. That's important and allow us to respond uh, to the, in, in an appropriate manner. We'll provide an incident number and agree callback arrangements to ensure we're not uh, calling when we shouldn't do. We want regular updates from offshore to ensure we're getting the most appropriate information. And um, from there, we'd expect the offshore to phone their own, own onshore emergency response team, where they'll get a lot of support in terms of the, 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 the roles you see there. And so they're there to support uh, offshore. We would then expect to get a call um, from that onshore team as well. And that means there's a trio of calls going on here, making sure that we all got the latest updates, we can correlate information between us, and that's an effective communication flow. To improve that, we often ask for a maritime incident communication officer. That's uh, an officer, a person from the emergency response team who can mobilize down to one of our operation centers and provide uh, an additional communication flow there and bring expertise, guidance into the op room to provide us with that, that additional situation awareness. 
from there for both uh, oil and gas and renewables, uh, we would likely call the police very early to inform them of the incident, as would the emergency response team. And to notify the police, they provide uh, a lot of support uh, in terms of accounting for personnel, uh, investigating crime and so on. And, and, and they can provide a lot of support to the company and to the Coast Guard and they'll provide police liaison and officers as appropriate to support that flow of information as well. And from there, you then become, again, your crisis management, sort of business continuity type level. Uh, again, they'll link in, link in from the emergency response team, but also speak to the Coast Guard and the police. So this sort of builds up a picture, an operating picture of everybody involved in an incident, the types of people involved in an incident, and how it's important for everybody to work together to ensure them a, a, an effective flow of information. And this really is what the integrated offshore emergency response document I mentioned earlier is all about. Uh, and this slide, which is cluttered deliberately, um, shows the types of organisations uh, and agencies involved in, a, in an incident and who might be in, need to be informed of that incident. Uh, you see the four key players in the middle there, and um, the offshore installation, be that oil and gas or, or um, renewables, uh, the company, the Coast Guard and the police. We all must work together. Not one of those organisations is able to deal with an incident in its entirety. They require support from each one and it's important to make sure we all, we all work together uh, on that. Okay, um, a few bits and pieces to, to cover off. So, so we, as I mentioned, are responsible for um, civil maritime search and rescue. Uh, we train our staff um, on all number of, of elements um, working up to their full qualifications and work 24 hours 7 out of the operation centres. Um, and while um, the energy industry have procedures and requirements to support their people due to emergencies, um, and you must have those uh, arrangements in place, we are there to provide support uh, as required. And much of that might come from the dedicated search and rescue resources, such as the helicopters, such as lifeboats, RNLI, or other charitable organisations, perhaps Coast Guard rescue teams, perhaps we might need to do some search planning, or we might get third-party resources, such as your own resources, standby vessels, crew transfer vessels, and special operation vessels. And whatever might be out there, you might rely on them to support as well. But understanding that search and rescue really is there as a UK resource of last resort, and to go to those at greatest need. And we are out doing a number of exercises. I'll cover off a couple of them again later on. We are keen to, to get involved in, in industry, oil and gas, and uh, renewables both from an offshore type perspective and from onshore so if anyone's got exercises or have exercise planned uh, please do get in touch and we can we can support uh, with those exercises and um, part of training is very important and i mentioned already we we run a, a search and rescue course for oil and gas this is a picture um uh, terrible that i'm actually in this picture it's awful should be encouraged and um, however uh, this is a renewables course that, that we ran this one was actually down in bridlington at our humber operation center and we've started providing courses for the renewables industry as well. And so that one is supported by, again, the police and also the health and safety executive. And that proves that we, um, the importance of, of collaborating and, and working together with the regulators to make sure that a common message is delivered. Um, and and you know, this course is suitable for, for a range of people from um, offshore installation managers, marine coordinators, vessel crews, management, um, whoever may have an interest or interaction with, with the Coast Guard. And we do highly recommend it to, to cover off all the terminology and procedures that we would expect um, from industry. A joint in with um, the, the course as an, initi an initiative that the HSC and the MCA have, have started over the past uh, couple of years um, in running uh, uh, inspections of offshore renewables this time. And this has been um, really productive. It's shown that emergency preparedness does vary um, amongst companies, amongst sites. Uh, and while it's an improving picture, there's still some way to go. And um, so a lot of positive engagement, uh, a lot of positive work with the industry uh, and, and some really good messages um, coming out from, from there. Uh, coming back to our own um, uh, IT, uh, to work a better word, uh, we have a number of uh, systems available to us. What you're seeing here is, is a, a gazetteer function we use. And you can see an installation there, the full Moralfa in there, which has its position. Once you click on that, it brings you up some more information on that, that installation, including contact telephone numbers, a picture, and some, some basic information to allow our staff a bit more information about that, um, that installation. Built into that, we've also started getting installation summary sheets, 
which is a bit of a, a fast facts document of the, those installations. And we also get emergency response cooperation plans from renewables, effectively to mean that if something happens, we do have information available to us in the operations room to ensure that, that we can provide it the best response we can. And now just to concentrate a little bit on renewables for a, for a couple of slides, um, because I said it is uh, well, a new term, new kid on the block, although it's been around for, for a while now. Um, but the industry is growing, um, and it's growing both in scale and distance from shore, which is encouraging. It's positive in terms of meeting the government's renewables uh, targets, uh, but it does provide some challenges um, to search and rescue. Part of that is due to turbine size. Um, so we, when I started doing this, um, these presentations, uh, the little um, image I've got in the top right there of, of scale, uh, it had sort of um, 2015 and, and the future as being um, sort of nine, 10 megawatt turbines. They very much are the current now, uh, and we're looking for turbines which are, are much, much bigger. Uh, potentially in the next few years, you might have a uh, height to the tip of the blade of, of coming up towards 300, 300 meters. Uh, which really is, is quite extraordinary. That causes us challenges. That means more likely going to be in cloud, and that means that searching with the helicopter is more challenging. And um, they are uh, larger across. Some of the wind farms may well be 10, 15, 20 miles across. You build them together, and you you end up a massive area of sea, which has uh, an impact with with turbines. Searching becomes a problem. Rescuing becomes a problem. And yes, there is a lot of support from the industry that they've got a lot of asset out there a lot of innovation which is really positive um, but they're not going to be there all the time and sometimes you might have to go in there with lifeboats and helicopters uh, to respond to incidents adjacent developments are interesting as space becomes uh, restricted uh, operators developers look to build extensions and wind farms next to other ones uh, which affects i mean you might have a nice layout i'm going to talk about layers just a moment like the one in the picture there you put another wind farm next to that and you could really uh, limit the access into that that area. Distance offshore, I mentioned already, so distance offshore, um, whereas before we were maybe a couple of miles, a few miles within territorial waters, and um, the, the latest wind farm to be built is over 60 miles offshore, that's six zero uh, miles. So they're becoming into the oil and gas realm of um, accessibility. We're talking about helicopters more, and we're talking about uh, dedicated resources offshore. So it's an interesting conversation but one that certainly requires a lot of a lot of time and effort from industry and from the, the MCA to ensure that that's, that's done effectively. And so layout, layout is what I spend a fair amount of my time uh, discussing uh, and for good reason. Um, the MCA asks for uh, two lines of consistent lines of orientation that you can see in the, in the diagrams here, meaning that SAR assets, particularly helicopters, can enter the wind farm from, from outside uh, and proceed through it in a constant direction, come out the other side without impacting any turbines. Uh, any aircraft activity inside the wind farm is, is high workload. There are obviously risks from those sticks in the seas, uh, but therefore increasing the number of orientation lines through there improves the access into that wind farm. Not so desirable potentially for developers. Uh, it's not so efficient in capturing wind. Uh, there is wake effect that they have to consider in terms of um, the, the, the turbines taking the power out of the wind. So we have to work on a case-by-case -case basis uh, with developers, considering what sort of uh, nautical impact they have, what a sort of risk to traffic they have, and then what assessment they have and on what resources they have available to respond to incidents. Effectively, something of that nature does give us serious concerns. And that's because there's not such a good access into that wind farm. If we have a particular wind direction or poor visibility, it makes it much more difficult to search and much more difficult to, to rescue people. And one of the challenges that, that we do have with renewables particularly is, I uh, mentioned there, that, that they do have a lot of um, resource to support. However, if you get a bad night or, or some poor visibility, they're not going to be working out there. Potentially, they don't have resources out there. And then if something does happen, we have to go and respond to it with, with our own uh, resources. Uh, so going back to um, renewables themselves, uh, and if you have an incident on a turbine in particular, which is the most difficult structure to get access to, then we have to look, or industry have to look at ways of getting them off. Normally that means winching them, or, or rather evacuating them down onto a vessel. So that might be internally, down using their lifts or stairs in inside the tower, or it might be, as you can see in the pictures, lowering a stretcher uh, down externally 
and either directly onto a lifeboat if possible or onto a crew transfer vessel to start with. The vessel, that would normally be the best and quickest means of doing things, getting them onto a vessel and then if required, we can always come with a helicopter and, and winch them off the vessel from there. Although, to be fair, most of the industry vessels are extremely quick and can get back to shore in, in good time. If we have a situation, however, where the casualty is potentially further offshore or has got a more significant injury or illness that may require evacuation from the top, then we have procedures in place which may allow us uh, to get into the nacelle, which is the bit on the, the top of the, uh, the wind, the, the turbine, uh, to winch a casualty off the turbine from there. It does require the blaze to be in a particular position. It does require the, the, the orientation of the wind, uh, of the nacelle into the wind, uh, and it requires um, the, the aircraft to be able to get in there safely. But if, that, if that's possible, then that might be an option. But that has to be factored in to the emergency response plan of that wind farm to ensure that communication with us is there uh, and to make sure that timing is that so there's no point getting somebody up onto the, the nacelle if it's not possible for us to, to come and get them from, from there. Okay, uh, sticking with uh, evacuation for a moment and a bit switching uh, industries, uh, I want to come back to oil and gas for a moment and, and really reflect on, a, on a, a couple of incidents that have happened over the past uh, two and a bit years. Um, one was to the, the Bruce installation, which is the one on the, the left, um, and uh, uh, sorry, the other one to Bruce, and then Brent Charlie is the, is the other in installation. Uh, both of these installations um, suffered uh, a failure of their, their, their power generation uh, and effectively resulted in uh, personnel offshore being without power and lights and, and so on that goes with that. And the upshot of both those incidents were that um, search and rescue aircraft were, were mobilised and individuals were evacuated off those platforms to neighbouring neighboring installations. Uh, however, this is not really the, the required um, route and not really a requirement or, or, or suitable route for, for SAR aircraft. If I take it back to a moment, effectively, um, if you have a power failure on an installation, uh, you are in no emergency state you have got a situation which is a, a welfare issue, not a very pleasant issue, I don't suspect, but a welfare issue nonetheless, and something that should be handled um, by the in industry's own resources, such as crew change, commercial air transport, helicopters. Uh, they're not in an emergency, there wouldn't be an emergency phase, uh, and therefore SAR aircraft shouldn't be, shouldn't be um, used. Uh, they have been uh, in the past um, because of either not correct assumptions or there's been complicating factors such as uh, bad weather. Um, and there was one example as well, so I've not got on the screen, uh, down in the Southern North Sea, uh, during Beast from the East, which was, when was that, the start of 2017, 2018, whenever that was, uh, any winter of that, of that winter, very nasty weather, and the personnel offshore ended up in, in, in um, very cold conditions, and potentially there was a risk to their, their lives from there. So therefore we were justified in going to support those incidents. Uh, from the Brent Charlie particularly, the evacuation, there was a couple of learning points came out of that as well, which I thought would be useful to share uh, with you if there was a similar sort of situation again. And this is the sort of difference between the evacuation, which is a, a Coast Guard emergency, a fear defined evacuation, and you're leaving in an emergency, therefore you should not be taking any baggage with you. Um, the SAR aircraft are not um, kitted out to take bags like you would be in, in a cabin of a, a crew change aircraft. Bags are extra weight and they're um, extra space and they're not secured. Therefore, um, we wouldn't expect anyone to have bags with them when they leave on a, on an Assad aircraft. Um, linked to that, you shouldn't be using any electronic tracking systems such as Vantage or other equivalents. The main reason for that is we're not able to t uh, say how many personnel the Assad aircraft is going to take off. That's going to rest on the aircraft captain, depending on the situation and weight and weather limits. Uh, so using uh, Vantage could delay things and did delay things in, in these incidents. And also, uh, the coming on a SAR aircraft uh, personnel may not have uh, a life jacket or, or other PPE uh, on at the time, depending on the, 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 the nature of the, of the evacuation. Uh, so that's a point to note uh, so that people are aware. If it's a down man, so I class a down man as a controlled uh, down man of personnel using crew change aircraft for such things such as power or 
um, dirty water. You're taking people off back to shore using crew change aircraft in a controlled manner uh, and not during an, an emergency. So that would be a down man in an emergency, it's an evacuation. Um, so so that's it. that was some interesting learnings I came out of, of those incidents. And I've actually changed and updated the integrated offshore emergency response document to reflect some of the learnings from that. And um, now I want to talk about onshore winds uh, briefly. And uh, now you might think, why is a Coast Guard talking about uh, onshore? Uh, but actually, uh, a lot of the learnings from offshore are equally applicable to, to onshore. Now, I, I did have a video to play here, um, but it's not working on my, my laptop. But you can Google it, and, and effectively, the, the blades of that turbine uh, start to fly off. You may have seen it um, previously. Um, but very similar issues. Um, Non-uniform layouts, obviously varying heights because of topography of, of mountains and so on. Equally remote areas, yes, you might not be surrounded by the sea, but it's still in the middle of Scotland, middle of Wales, trying to get uh, the emergency services or support to some of these wind farms in a very remote um, areas is, is a challenge. Communication issues, so you might not have mobile reception, you might not have other, other means of communicating. Um, emergency response plans are equally important, but onshore wind is slightly further behind um, where offshore is. And you've got more than one emergency service. Um, offshore, you have the Coast Guard. And onshore, um, you've got obviously police fire ambulance uh, and the Coast Guard if, if we come support with the, with the SAR helicopter. So it is more complicated, but, but um, work is ongoing to ensure that they are as prepared as possible. And I get involved in, in that to share my experiences as best I can. Okay, not many slides to go. You'll probably be uh, relieved to, to hear. Um, I mentioned exercises earlier. Um, the SAR aircraft um, are keen to get involved in renewables incidents because they are a challenge and they are a hazardous area if we have to go into them. So thanks to a number of wind farms, a number of operators, we were able to get out to uh, in, in exercises uh, at these wind farms. Uh, and this really helped to prove that the procedures that we'd come up with up to that point, which mostly were theoretical, um, were actually uh, justified uh, and, and were, were, were important to ensure the safety of aircraft and to ensure search and rescue was possible within these wind farms. Since then, uh, in May this year, we've been out to the Hornsey One wind farm, it's under construction, and that's the one that's 60 miles offshore, so the first one of, sort of that scale uh, and, and distance offshore. Uh, and we've had some really useful feedback from the helicopter crews, five different flights and I'm busy writing up the report from that. So it's, it's really useful to come out to wind farms and get involved in oil and gas incidents, uh, exercises to learn um, from, from those. And I just want to talk about uh, medical evacuations for a moment because there are some interesting learnings from, from this. Um, so communication is important. So if there is a case offshore um, with a, a, a medical uh, nature, it's important to communicate that with the relevant authorities on shore be that the own company uh, doctors or um, back to the Coast Guard for our um, radio medical advice. They're effectively making sure that communication comes into us and we can provide support and guidance to make sure a doctor is involved and provides that assistance and if required authorization for a, a SAR helicopter or other SAR resource to come offshore uh, and take a, a casualty back to, back to, um, back to hospital. Um, they will determine, um, I, I apologize for the terrible clip art, um, but uh, there we go. Uh, they will determine how quickly that casualty needs to be seen in hospital, what sort of facilities they need back on shore, um, to make sure the right resources out there and the right support to that casualty as quickly as they, as they can. And the, work, the system works very well. We do a number of these evacuations uh, and I can provide lots of other information and learning um, based on that. However, one of the, the areas that's been a, a hot topic of conversation uh, for a number of years um, is around uh, mental health. Uh, and mental health has been addressed, um, or, or rather is uh, approached in, in uh, society in a much better way now, it's more understood. But there have been a number of challenges uh, offshore, particularly with oil and gas, but equally um, with renewables. In fact, there's been a couple of incidents onshore with renewables as, as well. And, and, and what I want to raise here uh, is the complexities of getting somebody with uh, an altered mental state uh, back on shore and um, from an offshore environment. And a couple of years worth of work, we've now produced a document, um, Acute Psychiatric Emergencies, a uh, practical guide to uh, something or other in a remote environment. Um, and uh, that's a really good read. Uh, and it's, um, it's been a lot of work um, from the um, from personnel involved in the Topside Medical Forum um, which brings together topside uh, doctors, 
uh, SAR providers, NHS. Um, so that, that document will be available on the EPOL website, although I can circulate it um, at any stage by email. Uh, and, and it gives some guidance to those working offshore about how to treat uh, emergency response. Uh, mental health, my apologies. Um, now, uh, just quickly, um, a, a comparison, about two slides, uh, two slides to go, two, three slides to go. Um, during the search and rescue management courses, I do a bit of an icebreaker um, for, uh, to get things going. And I ask them what one word or phrase would sum up the emergency response arrangement. So the, I've got a couple of examples from the, the renewables industry. Um, forgive my writing, the one on the left is my writing. Um, I realised very quickly that they were saying very long words, uh, therefore I got the HSE to write the, 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 the words for the following courses. Uh, however, um, there's a number of these words um, on here uh, which I don't necessarily think fill me full of confidence about suitable emergency arrangements, evolving, theoretical, sufficient, satisfactory. Uh, they're not necessarily the words I'd, I'd, I'd hope to hear. And interestingly, the same on, on a different course, different day, different month, similar sort of words. Uh, in fact, evolving um, is, is, in, is in both there as, as well. Um, what's also interesting on this, on this slide is the word standardised, which came up on both courses. Uh, they might be standardised for a company, they certainly are not standardised across industry. And the same could be said for, for oil and gas. And we see a big difference between companies, between response plans, and some, some for good reasons, some for not so good reasons. Uh, and therefore, that's, there's certainly a work way to improve that and standardise things across the piece. Um, I've concentrated on, on UK response. Um, I do work with other countries around, around the world. There is a, a, a forum which is set up um, in, in, in the EU to discuss certain elements in renewables to try and look at cooperation and standardisation across the EU. That's just coming to an end uh, at the moment and we'll see whether that uh, progresses in the future years. That might rest on a certain uh, political um, topic, uh, but that, that is positive. I've also got engagement with um, those in the States and um, with EU countries um, uh, to share learnings, to um, share documentation, uh, and that very much is my message to industry as well, to, to share amongst each other uh, resources, learning, ultimately to try and prevent um, something large happening. And um, which really, to summary, I come back to, to Mumbai High, and, and the reason I, I mentioned Mumbai High, for those of you that, that aren't uh, particularly familiar with the, with the incident. And um, this was um, back in, in 2005, as I mentioned earlier. And it all started with the, the Sumudra Suraksha, um, which just in the afternoon, um, uh, the chef got injured uh, on that vessel. Uh, there was some bad weather in the area, so the helicopter wasn't operating. Uh, so the decision was taken for the vessel to approach the platform to transfer the, the chef uh, by basket um, up to the platform. Um, so by about four o'clock in the afternoon, um, the vessel approached in, made contact with the, the risers of the platform, and you can see the result um, of that fire um, that happened from there. Large number of responding vessels, large number of evacuees, uh, 362 personnel were recovered over 15 hours, uh, 11 fatalities and, and 11 missing. And it's a really nasty incident that was effectively caused in the first case um, by, a, by a, a relatively small injury uh, to someone on board the vessel. I know the HSE are looking a lot at attendant vessels. I'm not saying every bump into an installation would result in, in that type of incident. The risks are there, uh, and it's about being fully aware of those risks um, before, before hopefully they, they occur. So just to sum up, really, um, the MCA and, and the Coast Guard are sometimes criticised for removing goalposts uh, or always thinking worst case, but, but that's kind of really what we have to do. We only move the goalposts to move with industry. So as industry develops, we want to move with there. Developing new policies and procedures um, to adapt to that changing environment. And we do like to participate in regular exercises um, and, and explore options for joint exercises, whether that's between the same interests of two wind farms, for example, or even potentially in the future, wind farms and oil and gas, because actually they're becoming in the environment of being very close together as, as well. Sharing resources, you've got skilled workforce, you've got um, specific vessels and, and resources, so share them where you can. And please do share experiences, share lessons learned through industry groups, through forums, and um, share your lessons because that's how we learn and that's how um, near misses and, and, and incidents don't go, go amiss and, and we learn from them. Um, so thank you for, for really listening to me for the past um, uh, 50 minutes or so. I hope that was useful uh, and I, I would welcome uh, any questions. Thank you. 
Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, Pete. That was, that was brilliant. Um, <clears throat> we do actually have uh, some questions for you. Um, before I go into the questions, I'm just going to quickly launch uh, for all of you listening in today uh, a quick poll, which is just uh, just to get some general feedback on today's webinar. Uh, so if you could take a few moments uh, over the course of the Q&A just to complete that, um, that would be brilliant. Uh, right. So, um, Pete. Uh, a question here, um, the first question I'm going to ask is, uh, how do you integrate with local resilience forums or say, or county councils, EPOs? Okay, uh, good question. Um, so we have uh, some coastal uh, representatives um, who effectively manage our volunteer coast guards on the ground. Um, so they are our local um, links into the, the various resilience forums and partnerships in, in Scotland and in, in England and Wales. Uh, we also have a, a resilience team in headquarters who link at a sort of higher level with, with those. And then through my work as um, staff officer, liaison officer for any particular um, oil and gas or, or renewables um, affected topics, then they'll approach me and link into those um, for specific answers to questions. Okay. Um, <clears throat> with regard to the new national resilience standards, uh, how do you dovetail into the CCA 2004 and its uh, nas uh, new national resilience standards? Okay. Um, I'm probably not the, the best person to, to respond to that, that question in, in great detail. Um, we do uh, have a lot of work with um, the, the, the Civil Contingencies Act. Um, we look a lot at um, various incident uh, reviews or, or um, uh, public inquiries um, into, for example, um, the uh, Grenfell or the Manchester bombings and so on, because there are learnings that come out for any emergency services. Uh, in terms of, of dovetailing um, into, into those, um, we work, as I said, we've got a resilience um, team uh, down south, so they, they lead on, on those, those areas um, and ensure really that our, our, our work and our, um, our resources are known to emergency services um, you will may have known, some of you may have seen a certain advert um, a few years ago, a good few years ago, I should add, um, by a certain breakdown service, which claimed to be the fourth emergency service. And so it's really for us about educating um, the other emergency service on our, our capabilities and where we can support them uh, inland, uh, as well as, as our maritime obligations. Um, and it's making sure that we do ensure those maritime obligations are, are maintained even though we can support uh, in, in land as well. And, and, and really, I think it's just about coming together and ensuring that integrated response and, and that Civil Contingencies Act um, peace is, is maintained um, because you know, there's, a, there's a big demand on the emergency services across the board uh, and, and where we can support each other is important. And I think just a final point on that, as I can mention earlier on, because we are UK wide, um, we do have a, a, a good understanding of working with the various um, police forces, ambulance um, services, um, fire and rescue services um, across Scotland, England and, and Wales and Northern Ireland. I hope that answers that question. A bit of a waffly answer, but hopefully that helps. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> so we've got a few more that have come in now as well. So uh, the next one I'm going to ask here is, uh, after notification of an incident, what is the time frame for issuing a statement to the public uh, or via social media? Okay, uh, that, that's, a, that's a really really good question as well. So I, I actually, I'll just come back and, um, and answer that in a different way. There's um, a number of different things happen. That for, for, for industry particularly, we have been accused in the past um, of, uh, I suppose, covering up uh, or, or withholding, I should say, not covering up, withholding information uh, for industry incidents. Sometimes we work with uh, duty holders um, in terms of um, the statements to, to the press. And the press will ask us if anything's going on and we'll say, well, we're, we're not doing anything at the moment. And um, ultimately, um, we have an obligation to inform the, the, the press of, of incidents. And um, so pretty quickly now, if we have a, an energy in incident, um, bearing in mind we get check calls to the various operations room every hour or so from, from the press, uh, we would confirm uh, that we're responding to an incident. And we have, for example, sent a search and rescue helicopter from Humberside to assist in an industry incident. Um, 100 miles east of, of on that's a bit far, but, but 50 miles east of, 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 of Hull, for example. Uh, we wouldn't name the installation, we wouldn't name the um, operator, but it's, but it's effectively allowing the public a bit of information on, on what's going on. 
when, when it comes to statements, social media statements and so on, that would come slightly later down the line. I don't want to put a time scale on it, but one of the roles for our uh, operation centres and our, our controllers is to notify our GD press office and to allow them to, to respond to some of those um, uh, sort of situations and work with the company and with the police particularly in issuing statements. And um, just, I just, and I'm aware of time and maybe a, a question or two more, but I just want to, just for interest's sake, there are three stages, stages to a media uh, incident, uh, and you'll see this next time you see a big incident happening, uh, and they are um, mayhem, mastermind, manhunt. Mayhem, there's breaking news coming in, there's red ticker tape coming on the bottom of your screen, Sky News, BBC News, information coming off, we've got some footage on BBC, on, um, on mobile phones, we're not really very sure where it is, we're gathering information. Mastermind, they'll peel out some expert, so whether it's an aviation expert, a security expert, or for example, um, an expert on, on, um, on Notre Dame, when that went on fire, things like that, and they'll put their spin on what they think is happening. Whether or not they've got any idea of what's actually happened, that's what the media will run with. And then manhunt, who's to blame? And on that incident I mentioned that I was involved in that collision, it was that manhunt bit that came in um, really quickly. Um, so there we go. Again, not sure if I've answered that question, but hopefully that helps. Okay, great. Um, regarding uh, heli platforms on wind turbines, is there a specific rescue case for having them, um, or are they better avoided? Um, okay, um, I'm not sure. I'll, I completely get the question. Um, I think um, that, so. The two things. So on um, wind turbines at the moment, there are no um, actual platforms for landing on, um, but the the actual hoisting areas are certainly beneficial on on having them there. They're put there to allow uh, the um, the industry to to hoist their technicians um, to the turbines and uh, as an alternative to walk to work or to, to pushing on the vessels. Um, but from a search and rescue perspective, if there was an incident, it does allow a safe area for our winchmen to access the the, the nacelles. And um, so while it's a, a a low likelihood eventuality, um, if the need was there, it's certainly a safer area for us to get onto. For turbines, either early early build turbines, which are smaller and don't have them, or for some turbines which are built which don't have these baskets or have other equipment on the roof that they can't access, it does make it much more difficult, if not impossible, for us to, to get onto them. Um, so if, if I haven't answered that question, or if, if there's a different intention for that, that question, please, um, you'll send it through again. I can answer it again. Yep. Okay, great. Um... There's a couple more, so we'll try, we'll try and get through the, these last ones. Um, is there a timescale for the new version 3 EPOL document that's going live? Um, yeah, so that, that document has now been released. Um, it, well, I have circulated to my contact list, um, and I've, um, I've asked the police to upload it onto the EPOL website. Obviously, they're a little bit busy just now with the um, a certain incident, um, but as soon as they get a moment, they'll, they'll release that. If anybody wants a copy of it and doesn't have it, um, you'll feel free to, to contact me and I can send it through. Okay, great. And I, I'm not sure whether this is uh, relating to the same same document or a different one, but uh, is the recently revised um, OIER document freely available if you're not a member of G9 Plus or RUK? Okay, yeah, good question. So the um, I'm I, to be perfect, I'm not completely sure exactly um, on the timescale of this document. Effectively, what this is, I've not mentioned it much, is there was an equivalent document to this IOER one I mentioned um, for renewables. Uh, this was worked on by uh, the police, HSE and MCA, along with industry. Um, the idea was that G+, which for those who aren't aware, are, was the Global Health and Safety Organization for Renewables, um, they uh, decided to take that, that uh, document on and it was going to be, become a more global, um, global uh, document. Um, that I don't, I don't know the exact a release date for that, but I would hope that it was circulated wider than just the G Plus membership. I'd hope that it'd have a good um, circulation to that as well. Um, mixed with that, there is a new, for those of you in the UK, um, the HSC and MC have produced a regulatory expectations for emergency response document, and that's the one that those organisations, myself and, and um, Trevor from HSC, will be pushing um, for our expectations there. Okay, great. Um, just one final question then, um, before we, before we end here, um, do you have any enforcement powers? Uh, so, for example, in relation to uh, maritime security, um, difficult. The answer: the MCA do have some enforcement powers when it comes to the Merchant Shipping Act. And um, for instance, either in UK territorial waters, 
um, or for UK flagged vessels um, at, at any point in, in international waters. And when it comes to maritime security, it, it gets a very difficult and different sort of uh, legislation in terms of, of what can and can't be prosecuted or what, what, what we do get involved in. When it comes to maritime security, we're, much, we're more involved in sharing information with um, other agencies such as Border Force and National Crime Agency, the police, um, and, and use their powers for, for some of the sort of security implications. It's normally only those breaches to um, merchant shipping legislation that we'd, we'd enforce our powers. Okay, fantastic. Uh, well, that is actually all the questions, um, and we are pretty much bang on time. So that's brilliant. So thank you very much, Pete. That was uh, that was really informative, and from the from the feedback we're getting and from the comments that people are coming back with, um, it looks like it was extremely well received. So, so thank you very much for 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 coming in and uh, agreeing to to deliver this session for us. A pleasure, and I said, if any of the the attendees have got any follow up questions or want anything in the future, I'm more than happy to to help. Uh, once again, Pete, thank you very much for, for delivering the session.